And thank you for downloading this pre-recorded presentation brought to you by the American Institute of Building Design. I'm Steve Mickley, Executive Director, and the AIBD is a nonprofit association dedicated to the enhancement, development, and recognition of the residential and building design professions. Today's presentation is part of our continuous quest to provide relevant information to those who are currently practicing or interested in the building design disciplines. Now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Senior Engineer Wood Specialist with the APA, Bob Clark. You bet. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to also say uh, welcome to everyone. And uh, this is uh, the third in a five-part series where we're talking about wall bracing. And hey, those of you who have been following along with parts one and parts two, uh, you might be happy to look at the title of this one and see simplified wall bracing in the title. Uh, and we will certainly go over that, uh, some of the simplified uh, methods as compared to what we've been looking at the last couple of uh, uh, webinars. And also being part three, uh, Steve just mentioned all of these are being recorded. You'll be able to take a look at all of the different webinars uh, as they are posted to the website. And I'll give that website address at the very end of the webinar for your reference. APA is a trade association, just like AIBD is, and our members are the manufacturers or the wood mills that produce wood structural panels, which is plywood and oriented strand board in the codes, or OSB, and also engineered wood products like glue lamb, eye joist, and other structural composite lumber uh, products like LVL, or laminated veneer lumber. And we provide certain services to these members, the quality auditing out at the mills. We do marketing services. We do uh, testing and research, work with the codes, and a variety of other services for our members. Now, over the years, APA has been very involved with testing and research of diaphragms and shear walls and uh, research in high wind situations and in seismic situations. And that has really positioned us very well uh, to be the experts in wall bracing. And wall bracing has really become a big topic in the last decade or so since there's been many changes within the uh, code regarding wall bracing. Uh, so that's why I'm happy to uh, be able to present this webinar series on wall bracing for AIBD. Here is just the whole list of the five parts of this webinar series, and we've completed uh, number one and number two, uh, where we talk about uh, just really what bracing is and, and how to use it. And in this part three, we're going to look at another couple of methods for bracing that we refer to as simplified wall bracing. And then we'll also break down a little bit and look at, hey, what are you going to give the building official? What, what should you as designers or as builders be providing? And as part of that, I'm going to show you another tool that APA has available, something called our APA bracing calculator. I think you're really going to like it. Um, we are going to have two more webinars in this series. Uh, webinar Bracing 4 is uh, going to be handled by my esteemed associate, Roger Roach, who's going to tell us about all the seismic-related provisions within the bracing section of the code. And then Wall Bracing 5 is going to be handled by another uh, colleague of mine, Mr. Brian Redling, who's a uh, PE down in the Carolinas, and he's got a lot of experience with high wind design, and uh, he's going to really, it's outside of bracing, but talk about, hey, what do you do when, uh, when you're above, uh, you're at 110 miles per hour or higher, and you fall outside of prescriptive wall bracing. So hope you'll uh, tune in to those webinars as they come up as well. So we've been looking at this uh, agenda taken right from the commentary book, A Guide to the 2012 IRC Wood Wall Bracing Provisions. That's a book that was 
co-authored between APA and ICC, or the International Code Council. And we've stepped through many of, most of all of these uh, categories. And as you can see, we're all the way to the last one. We're going to talk about this simplified wall bracing. Uh, and then when we get into uh, the seismic uh, portion in the next webinar, we'll double back and look a little bit more at regular buildings and connections and foundations, etc. Let's take a quick review of some of the things from the first two webinars. Um, first off, we just uh, really defined braced wall lines. And braced wall lines are all of the exterior walls of a home and some of the interior walls. And these are the walls that can provide the stiffness to resist the lateral loads, whether that be from wind or whether that be from seismic activity. And each brace wall line has a, is spaced apart from the other brace wall lines. We would refer to that as the brace wall line spacing. And then within each brace wall line, there are brace wall panels. And these are what actually provide the bracing. And of course, the brace wall panels within the brace wall line then have a spacing between those. So there's brace wall lines and brace wall line spacing. And within those, there's brace wall panels and brace wall panel spacing. We looked at a total of 16 different brace wall panel methods that are in the 2012 IRC. Uh, there's 12 what we refer to as the intermittent bracing methods, and those are shown on the screen right now. Uh, intermittent meaning they can be used standalone within a uh, braced wall line. And then there's also four more that are referred to as the continuous sheathing methods. Three of those are based on continuously sheathing with wood structural panels, your plywood or your OSB, and one of those is uh, based on continuously sheathing with structural fiberboard. So that makes 16 total brace wall panel types. Uh, if you want to review those, those are in the part two webinar portion. We also looked at the tables within the code that determine how much bracing is required? And it's based on either wind speed or on seismic design category. Uh, it's based on the story location, whether you're the, whether you're the top story or if you have a story above or two stories above. And it's also based on that brace wall line spacing, how far apart they are. And then finally, the type of brace wall panel, as you can see, uh, out of those 16 different brace wall panel methods. And you can determine then how much bracing is required. And in the end, we learned that there's actually tables that are for wind, and there's a set of tables that are for seismic, where you determine the amount of bracing required. And then also for wind and seismic, there's tables that have all kinds of adjustment factors. And in the end, you need to, if you're in a seismic zone, you need to look at the wind table multiplied by all of the adjustment factors in the wind adjustment table. And you need to look at the seismic table and all the adjustment factors in the seismic adjustment factor table. And then you need to look at whichever one of those is greater. We also learned that if you are in seismic zones A or B, or if you're single family in seismic design category C, that you're exempt from seismic, and you can look just at the wind tables. But in the end, we've determined how we come up with the amount of bracing required on each braced wall line. And then, of course, we can use those 16 different braced wall panel methods as appropriate to meet those requirements. We also looked in depth at the history of bracing. I just want to step uh, back a couple of code cycles here. And starting with the 2006 International Residential Code, that's when the first uh, commentary book co-authored between APA and ICC was developed. And as you can see, at that time, there were seven pages in the bracing section of the code, and then the commentary was 157 pages. So in other words, it was 157 pages to show how to use those seven pages within the code. And then the big change took place. From 2006 to 2009, things were really rearranged. There was a committee formed, an ICC ad hoc committee on wall bracing that 
took a new look at bracing, and there was a lot of very good changes, but as you can see, it increased the complexity, it increased the number of pages to 26 pages in the code, and a new commentary book was written, and it's 255 pages. And then continuing on, the 2012 IRC, and now is 28 pages of code, um, and the commentary book is 276 pages. Now you see in there that this 2012 IRC includes a section referred to as the simplified method. When you see this committee putting all this information together, realize that, yeah, we've, we've increased it. We've, we've got these different tables for wind and seismic now. We've got all these options added in. And options are good, but options add complexity. So it was determined that you know, maybe if you don't need all those options and if you fit within some smaller parameters, you could use a simplified method. And we're going to review that in detail today. So we have this simplified method right in the IRC. And then APA has, uh, uh, was part of that committee, has written uh, our own simplified method. It's a system report, so written in code language. Uh, we, we refer to it as our SR102, System Report 102. Uh, and I'm going to show you some of the differences. Uh, uh, we actually took even more um, options out, and actually we think it's a little bit more usable. This right now would be a alternate means and methods to the code. It's written like a, like a product report, but for a system that you could take to a building department uh, and say, I would like to use this method and get acceptance for that. So we'll take a look at these. First off, let's look at what's in the 2012 IRC. It, this is actually chapter R602.12. Uh, the bracing that I've covered in the first two webinars is R602.10. So R602.12 is the IRC simplified wall bracing. Again, it takes many options out uh, and many of the parameters are, are uh, taken away and it makes it easier. But there's less options. So you first off have to check, hey, do I fit within these parameters? And you'll note right away it's, it's only for the low seismic design categories. Uh, it's only for 90 mile per hour wind speed or less. And it's for wind exposure category A or B only. Now, that actually was changed in the 2015 IRC to include wind exposure category C. Uh, so keep that in mind. It's uh, valid for one or two story structures, which most structures are one or two story. Of course, the code allows for a third story. Um, and it's based on the use of only wood structural panel methods or structural fiberboard methods. Uh, you know, we talked about those 16 methods previously, and this narrows it down uh, to considerably less than that. And we'll get right into the different methods. It's based on structures that have no side greater than 60 feet. Uh, and you can see some of the other parameters as far as wall heights, uh, no long skinny buildings allowed, etc. no cripple walls. So the concept is, hey, if you can fit within these parameters, then you can use this simpler method. Let's take a look at how the R602.12 simplified method would be used. First off, simply take your plans and draw a rectangle around them such as this figure right here. And you can see on the left side is the first floor plan, a rectangle drawn all the way around the farthest outside parts of the plan. Same thing with the second floor. Sometimes, of course, those would, you would come up with the same size rectangle, but like in this example, there's portions of that first story that are not on the second story. So that rectangle is actually a little bit smaller. The second step would be determine how many bracing units are required on each side of the rectangle. And there's a table uh, like this in the code, table R602.12.4. And you can see that it's based on story level. Either you're the, you're, you have no story above or you do have a story above. And then E the ridge height up to 10 feet and then between 10 and 15 feet. How this table works is you take the side of the of one, one side of the rectangle to determine the amount of bracing required on the other side of the rectangle. If we recall from webinar part one, uh, we talked about how the, wind, it, the, the windward wall is, we're actually designing the perpendicular wall at that time. 
So look at this table and you have the number of bracing units on the long side is based on the length of the short side. So if the short side were say 40 feet and just look at the second row down uh, 10 feet first of a two story and you can see there would be four bracing units required. Now notice this table is actually duplicated. Now you have off to the right the number of bracing units on each short side to determine how many bracing units are required on the long side. So as you can, you know, it's the table duplicated. I mean, after all, you wouldn't want to have to use the same table twice, right? So it's duplicated for you to, uh, to try to simplify things. So now we've just determined the number of bracing units required, but what can be used as a bracing unit? And it's either wood structural panels or structural fiberboard. If you happen to be an intermittent, it needs to be at least four feet to be considered a bracing unit. And we talked about these terms in the last webinar, intermittent and continuous. However, if you happen to be continuous sheet, the whole wall sheet with that product, then it can be, uh, it can contribute as bracing as narrow as three feet. There's also these four narrow methods listed that are acceptable bracing methods. However, you can see not all of them contribute as, an, as a full bracing unit. Uh, that method PFH, which is portal frame with hold downs, kind of the, I introduced that last time as the heavy duty portal frame. And you can see that's equivalent to one bracing unit. The two narrow methods associated with continuous sheathing with wood structural panels, the CSG, continuous sheath garage, and the continuous sheath portal frame, each equivalent to a half of a bracing unit. And then you'll see the portal frame garage or PFG method uh, counts as three quarters of a bracing unit. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because uh, in testing the CS-PF method is, is, is actually stiffer than the PFG method, but uh, this is what ended up in the code. So this is what we're going to be uh, to use. I think the best way for me to show this simplified wall bracing is to go through an example. So let's take a look here at a, uh, a home that's a seismic design category B. So right away we know that we're exempt and that we can use this simplified method. Uh, it's uh, 90 mile per hour wind speed, wind exposure B. We're going to use the continuously sheathed wood structural panel method of bracing. It's just one story. The wall height happens to be 9 feet, and we have an eaved to ridge height of 12 feet. Those are kind of all parameters that we need to, to know ahead of time. So let's take a look at it. So here's the plan. First step, of course, draw a rectangle around it. So we draw this rectangle, and it turns out that one side of this rectangle is 59 feet 8 inches. Let's call that 60 feet. And one other side of the rectangle is 49 feet 4 inches. So let's call that 50 feet. And both of those happen to be less than 60 feet. We've checked the parameters of the building, and it all falls within the parameters that we can proceed. We can use this simplified wall bracing method. So let's look at the table now. We had the uh, were the top story, and we were we were greater than 10 feet, but less than 15 feet. I believe it's 12 feet eave to ridge height. So we can use that shaded row, and then we had one leg of the rectangle was 50 feet and one was 60 feet and both of those you can see end up with a solution of four bracing units required. So it turns out in this example we would need to have four bracing units on each of all four sides of this, of this rectangle. So let's look at the front and back or the horizontal lines first. Looking at that back or kind of brace wall line one as we see it. And we can find where we can place bracing units that with the CS-WSPR at least three feet wide in this method. And we count one, two, three, four, five of them. We needed four, so we're good. Now down on the front of the structure, off to the right, we have one, two, three CSWSP that are at least three feet wide. They contribute. And then over at the garage area, we've actually got the portal frames. And if you recall, those count as a half each. So that would give us a total of four and a half. Four and a half is greater than four. So this actually works. We also have to look at our placement. We need to be within 12 feet of the corners, within 20 feet of each other. And looking at that, we, we do fall within those parameters as well. Taking a look at the sides of the house, 
uh, you can see it's quite easy to find plenty of uh, bracing units on both the left and the right side. And that's pretty typical. I think most of the structures, uh, most of the houses that we look at bracing, the sides are fairly easy. There's very few windows and doors, lots of wall space. It's that front and back, usually the first story. That can be difficult to meet the bracing requirements. So this, uh, in the end, works. That was the R60212 simplified bracing method. Now I'd like to uh, take a look at the APA method, which is the SR102 method. Um, and this is just a little bit different. Again, APA was part of that uh, ad hoc committee that came up with the R60212 simplified. But we saw maybe some improvements that could be made with it with, again, less options. Options are good, but they add to the complexity. And we found that um, we were looking for a solution that could be used in more instances. When we looked at plans that builders are building every day across the country, we find that there was a, a, a very small number of plans where uh, R60212 simplified bracing actually could be used. They didn't fit within the parameters. So we've tried to come up with something or develop a system report simplified method that can be used in more circumstances, more options. Okay, why does it work? Why, is, why, why does it provide more solutions? Well, we've made a few assumptions. First off, we've assumed that the builder is going to be using 7 16 minimum wood structural panels. The code allows 3 8 There's very few markets in the country that use 3 8 category sheathing. So with 7 16 it's already stiffer than the 3 8 If you allow 3 8 in the code, you have to test everything and analyze to 3 8 Also, when there's a story above, the SR102 method assumes 4-inch on center fastening as opposed to 6-inch on center fastening. It's very important uh, uh, to, to note that more fasteners is a way to get more shear resistance. Now, this is required only when a story above. If you're the top story, it's only required still to have 6-inch on center fasteners. And then also, the uh, APA simplified method is based only on the use of continuously sheathed wood structural panels. So none of the other methods, so we're picking only the very stiffest methods. And I think this chart right here really uh, drives that concept home. This is from actual whole house testing done at the APA laboratory. And if you look at the, the third item down, which is labeled the wood structural panel WSP wall bracing base case. This would be intermittent bracing, in other words, corner bracing at the corners, 20 feet edge to edge, and this is considered the base case. Now, the code, when we just look at R60210 bracing, allows other bracing types such as lead-in bracing. Now, lead-in bracing from that whole house testing is actually only 31% as stiff as the base case, yet it still can be used as a bracing method. When you go the other direction, up, up the uh, chart here, the continuously sheathed wood structural panel, or CS-WSP, with openings is actually 88% stiffer than that base case of the intermittent bracing. 88% stiffer. And then if you use the portal frames where you have the extended header, it's 174% stiffer than the base case. Now the APA simplified method is based only on those top two methods, using continuously sheathed wood structural panels in portal frames, not even allowing the intermittent bracing. So you can see it, it has a more stringent requirement as far as the bracing type that is being used. Okay, let's take a look at how this system works. It's a very similar, but a, but a little bit different than what we just took a look at. There's four steps. Number one is simply looking at the parameters again, making sure that you fall within the system criteria and the limitations. Uh, step two is going to be, again, put that rectangle around it and determine the lengths and therefore the uh, amount of bracing required. Step three, we're going to look at 
all the bracing available to us on the walls. And step four is simply the comparison then, comparison of what's required versus what we have in, on that particular wall. So here's the system criteria. Uh, now I put in red the things that are different from the 2012 sim simplified bracing method. Uh, right away you see that this can be used for wall heights up to 12 feet. That's limited to 10 feet in R60212. Uh, it is, uh, can be used for wind speeds up to 100 miles per hour uh, as opposed to just 90 miles per hour. And it includes a multiplier to use wind exposure category C. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, C is not in the 2012 IRC version. However, it is in the 2015 IRC version. So step two, again, we're going to draw that rectangle around the house like we did before. And we're going to go to a table that is very similar. Uh, let's point out the differences. Uh, you can see that there's a whole other large row. It was 90 mile per hour. Now this 100 mile per hour is added. And then the answer rather than getting a number of bracing units, is actually the amount of feet of bracing, just like R60210, the main section of bracing is. So instead of the number of bracing units, you're going to pull off of this table the amount of bracing in lineal feet. You'll see the tables duplicated again, so you don't have to use the same table twice, one for each side of the rectangle. Now there is a, a, a multi couple of multipliers. Now this, of course, adds a little complexity, but it makes it more usable. Um, and there's a there's a multiplier for for story height or wall height. Uh, the base case is 10 feet. So if you happen to be a nine foot wall, you get a, a reduction factor of 0.95. Um, and also you can see the footnote D at the bottom, and that is for wind exposure category C. You would simply multiply the table amount by either 1.2 for single story or 1.3 for two story to determine the amount of bracing required when you have wind exposure category C in lieu of wind exposure category B. Just like in R60210 with continuously sheathed wood structural panel method, the width of the bracing unit is determined by the height of the opening that it is adjacent to. So if you look at the main part of this table under CS-WSP, and you can see that a 60 or 64 inch high window, a fairly typical window, uh, it can the bracing adjacent to that can be as narrow as 24 inches at 8 feet, 27 inches at 9 feet, 30 inches at 10 feet. If you do the math, you'll see that that's a 4 to 1 aspect ratio, the height of the wall divided by 4 you'll see as you get taller openings that you are required to have wider widths adjacent to those. So if we look at 80 inches, for example, a typical door, and it would be 32 inches at 8 feet and then 30 inches at 9 or 10 feet. Up at the top, you'll see that you can also use the two narrow methods that are associated with continuously sheathed with wood structural panel, that continuously, continuously sheathed garage, CS-G, which simply tells us you can use the top row of this table, that 24, 27, 30, even if it's adjacent to a garage door opening, as long as there's no story above. And then you can use the portal frame method with continuously sheathing. That gets you down to the 6 to 1 aspect ratio, the height of the wall divided by 6, which is 16, 18, or 20. And here's a nice bonus yet for the contributing length with the portal frame. Because it is somewhat stiffer, you can actually multiply it by 1.5 on your contributing length. Here's one other thing that was added, uh, and this partial credit for uh, narrower widths. Now, this can be extremely helpful. We're going to see that in our example in just a moment. Uh, again, it added a level of complexity, but it made it just so much more usable for more plans that we reviewed. Uh, so if you happen to be an eight or nine foot high wall, and that's all we've tested to date uh, with, with this partial credit, and say you happen to have 24 inches of width. Now that would have been fine for 60 inches or less on a, on a height of an opening, but if you get taller openings, you would have, would have had to be wider. But with this partial credit table, you can still use 24, but you have a smaller amount that contributes to the total. In other words, if we look at that 68 inch high opening, we had 24 inches, but it will contribute as 20 inches. And the same thing down on the next row, if you have 20 inches of width, which 
this is the only method without doing a portal frame in the entire uh, code, uh, really this is outside the code, but of a method that is less than 24 inches without doing a portal frame. So we're saying you can be as narrow as 20 inches, and as you get into taller openings, it will contribute as something less. Uh, for example, if you're at 64 inches, it will contribute as 18 inches by having 20. So this can be helpful for us. You also have to check the bracing distribution. Uh, we do need to have the first bracing unit within 12 feet of the corner, and edge to edge opening between bracing segments to be 20 feet. So once again, I think the best way to show the APA simplified method is to go through an example. So let's take a look at this, uh, just the front uh, first story of this house. And we see some of the parameters. Look at the house. It's got double windows on each side of the door, and a door with side lights, and two garage door uh, openings. There's not a lot of wall left for bracing. This can be a difficult wall to brace with uh, a lot of different bracing methods. But let's take a look at it. Uh, and some of the parameters that we'll need to know, the depth of the house is 40 feet. In other words, we're telling you ahead of time the side of the rectangle that we need to look up is 40 feet. Uh, this is a roof height of less than 15 feet, mean roof height, uh, eave to roof height. Uh, it's a nine foot first floor height, uh, first floor height, eight foot second floor height. It is in wind exposure category B with a 90 mile per hour wind zone. Uh, so let's take a look at it. So first off, I go to that table, and again, I was at the 15 foot eave to ridge height with a story above, and the 40 foot side, we see that I need 11.4 feet of bracing on that wall. So that's the number so far we're looking for. But don't forget the multipliers. Turns out we're a nine foot story height, so we can take that reduction factor of 0.95, and it turns out that we need 10.83 lineal feet of bracing on that wall. Now we start to take a look at that wall and say, okay, how do we get to 10.83 lineal feet? And we look at all the bracing segments that would contribute. And at first glance, uh, it doesn't look very good. Uh, we can put portal frames next to the garage, and we can contribute those. And remember, they're 1.5, so they count as 24 inches if they're 16 inches. Uh, we could put a portal frame in between the two garage doors. I think uh, it's going to, in the end, it's not going to be necessary, so we can probably omit that. Other than that, uh, because of these openings and because of the nine foot height, really we just have these th two 32 inch segments on each side of that front door. Uh, the 24 inch width is not quite wide enough when we're nine feet tall. That would have to be 27 inches wide. 24 would have worked for an eight foot high wall. So what's the next step? Well, if you recall, we had that partial credit table. And it, it can really help on a design like this, because suddenly now that 24-inch segment that the red arrow goes to, um, where it wasn't wide enough, it is now, but it doesn't count as 24. It counts as 22. And we have that again on the uh, right side of those double set of windows. And then over on the other windows, we have a 22-inch uh, uh, that counts as 18-inch. So uh, we actually pick up four bracing units here based on that partial credit for the brace wall panels. We'll just do a quick check of our distribution. And sure enough, I've got uh, panels within 12 feet of the corners. In this case, I actually have panels, uh, brace wall panels right at the corners. And I don't have any areas that are unbraced larger than 20 feet. So everything is good as far as the distribution requirements. So we can simply go back now and add up the amount of bracing we have. Starting from the left, and you'll see where they're being written right above the picture, that 16-inch portal frame counts as 1.5, so that counts as 24 inches. The next portal frame, 16 inches, also counts as 24 inches. Then we have that 24-inch segment. I'm going across all the green segments, if you will. It doesn't count as 24 because of the partial credit, so it counts as 22. I go to the next 22, it counts as 18. Then I've got the two 32s that count as actual width. And then the 22 counts as 18. The 24 counts as 22. Add those all up, that's 192 inches. That's 16 feet of bracing. 16 feet is definitely greater than 10.83 feet of bracing, so it worked. We were able to show that bracing worked with this SR-102 simplified bracing method.
And as you can see, the portal frames and the partial credit were a big key uh, to, to that working. Just a couple of other things to note in that system report. What if the house is over 60 feet long? Uh, one thing that you can do is divide it into separate rectangles. Uh, as we see here, it looks like that's probably a garage, that rectangle B. Uh, and if we can separate those into a rectangle A and a rectangle B and then design each of those rectangles separately, and as you can see, let me go back for just a second, one of the rectangle A was 50 feet on this side and rectangle B is 20 feet on that side. So when I go to the table for 20 feet and for 50 feet, I need 6.2 feet of bracing and 13.8 feet of bracing. So the key is when I put those two rectangles back together, that common wall would need to have the bracing for each of those rectangles. So we'll take the 13.8 plus the 6.2 and it turns out that I need 20 feet of bracing along that wall. Now the APA simplified method is based on testing that has been done in APA's laboratory. Uh, it's based on both uh, whole house testing, some of which I showed you results of, the cyclic shear wall tests, uh, a variety of other tests, and also just on APA's decades of research and investigations of both seismic and high wind types of failures, and really understanding how bracing works. Uh, so again, this is an APA system report. This actually falls outside of the code would be an alternate means and methods, but I think uh, if you work with your building department and, and show them that this is something that APA has put together and how closely we've worked with ICC regarding wall bracing, uh, that this should be accept, uh, accepted and that you can have confidence in using this method. All right, I'm real excited now to uh, share another tool with you. Uh, this is something that uh, I'm excited about, and the people I've showed it to so far, everybody's uh, very eager to start using it, and we call it our bracing calculator. This is an online tool where you will be able to enter the parameters of your design and show compliance or non-compliance with the code, and then print a report out and have something to turn in with your plans. Uh, so what a great tool. You can see that it says available soon, and that's very soon. The, the calculator's complete. We're, we've been using it in beta testing mode for quite some time, and APA is in the process of launching a new website, and we want to unveil this with the new website, and uh, that is being launched in August, and this is August, so <laughs> it, it should be at any moment. If you're watching the recorded version of this webinar, it is most likely up and running at the time that you are watching this webinar. So with that, uh, let's take a look at this wall bracing calculator. And I want to use another real-world example. So this is a uh, home from a builder that they've uh, been building over and over again. And let's take a look at it. Um, uh, I typically ask, what's the first step? And somebody out there, I know a bunch of you right now, said draw a rectangle around it, right? <laughs> somebody said that. And uh, that would be true if we were using the simplified bracing method. However, this bracing calculator, we're going back now to the first couple of webinars, and, and we're using the R60210 bracing method. So back to the uh, kind of long form, if you will, of bracing is what this calculator is designed to help with. So the first step is actually to define the braced wall lines. Now vertically, you can see probably three braced wall lines, the sides of the house and the side of the garage. Not very many windows, not very many doors, very easy to brace. That's pretty typical. However, when we look left, right, the front back of the house, in other words, you know, where are the braced wall lines? First off, I, I see these five as available. I see that one interior braced wall line if we need it. Um, and we've got the fronts and backs of the garage and the house. Well, I tried making the bracing work for this design like this and the front of the house and the front of the garage did not work. They were not in compliance. As you can see, there's very little bracing space along the front of the house. 
However, if you go back to webinar part one, what we learned with brace wall lines, it's very strategic uh, where they are placed. And if we can place the brace wall lines as such, and uh, within four feet of the actual walls, the front of the house, front of the garage, in this particular case, um, it actually ends up working, sharing that garage and the front of the house together. Uh, likewise, the back of the, the house, uh, you can share the back of the garage and the back of the house into one braced wall line. And this really uh, uh, makes it a little bit easier and in this case actually made it work where it wouldn't work in the past. Now actually for uh, entry purposes, this is elevation A, if you will, from this builder. And I, I chose to enter elevation B. It was a little bit simpler because instead of having those double windows, which are always tough on bracing by the way, and, and it doesn't have the little projection where the front door is. It's all one straight wall. I just did that to make it a little quicker and easier to uh, enter this information in front of all of you. So here's what we'll need. I've put these red numbers are simply round numbers that I'm going to use uh, for the bracing in the window widths. So we have uh, three feet of bracing, then eight feet of window, then four feet of bracing, then five feet of door with side lights, etc. And you'll see that there's two narrow segments on each side of that uh, overhead garage door. There's two foot two on the left, one foot eight on the right. These are actual dimensions from this plan. Some of the other parameters, uh, we're just going to look at that front first story. It's a wall height of nine feet. It turns out with that brace wall line spacing that I, uh, scheme that I just showed you that the spacing is 24 feet from, one to, from the front to the back where we placed the brace wall lines. The roof to eave height happens to be 14 feet. And this brace wall line length that we're going to enter is 54 feet 10 inches. Now for wind, you really don't need to know that. For seismic, you would. Uh, we're exempt from. We're going to say we're exempt from seismic and just look at wind in this case. Um, but still, I need to know that overall length, 54 feet 10, to enter it, uh, enter all the uh, components into the calculator. So with that, I am going to bring up the APA bracing calculator for you to take a look at. And again, I think this is going to be something that uh, is very useful to you. It's an online tool. So I'm going to go ahead and just hit Start New Project and just get some general information on this uh, particular design. It's, uh, let's call it B&D Builders. This is called the uh, Alpine and it's at uh, 123 Main Street, your town, right? And it can be either 2009 IRC or 2012 IRC. I'll go ahead and pick 2012 IRC. I'm going to pick the uh, seismic design category A through C for single family. And then the wind speed, so right now it's 85. I'm going to move that to 90 mile per hour wind speed. Wind exposure category is B. Number of stories, this is a two story. We're going to be doing the first of two stories. Uh, I'm going to say we have no cripple walls and our mean roof height is less than 30 feet. Just some parameters to be able to use prescriptive bracing. Now you'll note a lot of question marks uh, next to these words and these are great uh, tools. If I just hover over that one for a minute, that gives you all the code information about wind exposure category and a lot of great information. This is almost a tutorial on its own, if you will. Uh, I can look at the same thing for a number of stories and get some different information. How about wind speeds up here? Here's some information on wind speeds, etc. So there's just a, a lot of very good, useful tutorial type of information embedded throughout the whole bracing calculator. They can help you all along the way. All right, I'm going to hit Edit Brace Wall Lines next, and we're going to start to enter this particular wall. First off, I want you to see off at the lower left here. I've got a 1, 2, A, B. These are my braced wall lines, and it starts out a simple square, a rectangle, if you will, and it's because we're going to have at least four braced wall lines in every single house. Now, I can add as many braced wall lines as I might have horizontally there. I'll add one vertically. I can add all these these different brace wall lines. Now it turns out I don't need them for this particular design, so I'm going to take those back out. And we're actually going to be entering braced wall line two, which is that first story front of the structure. Some general information on that uh, brace wall line. First off, the di uh, furthest distance or the brace wall line spacing that we said was 24 feet. Uh, the roof eave to ridge height we said was 14 feet. This happened to be a 54 feet, 10 inch long wall. The wall height was nine feet. 
Do we have gypsum on the inside? Where required we do. Horizontal blocking, where required we do. And is it a single story? No, it's a first of a two story. So uh, I've just entered some general information. I'm going to go over here to wall line segment details now. Okay, off to the right, you will see some, some information. Well, everything I've entered, it's already gone to the tables and done all the calculations, and it's determined uh, that I'm 1.06 times the table value uh, for that braced wall line spacing, um, which would come up with a, a need of 7.95 feet if I'm using the continuous wood structural panel method, a 9.22 feet if I'm using an intermittent method, and a 16.11 feet if I happen to be using gypsum board. And you'll see it says that I'm non-compliant right now. Well, I'm not compliant because I, I haven't entered anything yet. It doesn't, it doesn't know what bracing we have. I'm going to go back to this details for just a moment. And you can see right now, if I say to change that to 8 feet instead of 9 feet, it changes the factors up here and changes the numbers. So everything is done automatically. I'll put that back at 9 feet. And what I'm going to do now is simply uh, go back to uh, this drawing, and I'm going to enter starting off to the left with this three foot of bracing, and then enter the window, enter the bracing, and I'm going to walk across this and enter this wall. So with that, back to the bracing calculator, I'm going to add my first brace wall line segment. What type is it? Well, it's a bracing segment. It happens to be continuously sheathed wood structural panels. It happens to be three feet wide. And right away, you can see that I now have three feet of compliant bracing. I'm still non-compliant because I need 7.95 feet, but I have three feet. I'm going to add my next segment. and My next segment happens to be an opening. It's a window. Happens to be eight feet and let's say it's 64 inches tall. Remember the height is important because that determines the allowable width of the bracing adjacent to it. Okay, so now I've got, and you can see the elevation building up here. A bracing unit, an opening. I'm just entering another bracing unit now. So I'll enter another bracing segment, continuously sheathed wood structural panel. This one happens to be four feet. So now we have seven feet of bracing. We're real close already. Now I can enter my door. So we go across the front of that. Uh, this happens to be five feet wide, and let's say it's 80 inches tall. And I can add another bracing segment adjacent to that. Let's say it's four feet. Now I, suddenly I have plenty of bracing. I'm compliant. You might think, well, I can stop. I have enough bracing. However, recall we still need to make it meet our placement requirements. So we need to be within 20 feet edge to edge and 10 feet from the corner. Uh, we have not met that as of yet. So right now it would still not work. Okay, now I need to add another window on the right side of that house. You recall there was another window on the side of the door. Uh, double window being eight feet total, 64 inches tall. And I can add another bracing segment. It happens to be uh, three feet. Okay, so there I am with the front of the house. Now I'm up to that garage. So I'm going to enter the garage, and I'm going to go back to the picture for just a moment. Um, and we've entered all the way across here with the garage. I've got two feet, two inches right here. Now, I could make that work as a, as a portal frame, right? I could make a portal frame there, and that could be a bracing unit. However, remember, portal frames are expensive. If I can avoid them, I should. I already have enough bracing. I have a bracing unit immediately to the left of that at the three feet. And if I put one over at that other corner where the one foot eight is, I'm within 20 feet. So technically, I really don't need that two foot two to be bracing. So rather than make it a portal frame, I'm just going to enter this two feet, two inches. Right now, I'm at 14. You can see I did not add any bracing for that. So it's just not going to contribute. If I needed it to, by all means, I would make that a portal frame. OK, and the next thing is our garage door opening. It happens to be a garage door. And I am actually going to wait to enter the length of that because I'm close to the corner. And the program right now uh, is concerned that I don't have a bracing unit next to the corner. So I'm going to go back and add that bracing unit first. This one does need to be a portal frame. Uh, and it's going to be ask you a couple questions now, 2x4, two 2x6. By two by and if you recall back to when we talked about the portal frames, that was to size the strap. Uh, is this the left or right side? It happens to be the right side. This is a 1 foot 8 inch wide portal frame with 2x4s. The top of the header, I'm going to say, is at 8 feet for a 7 foot garage door opening. 
Now I can go back and enter the 16 feet of my garage door. It happens to be a seven foot tall garage door. So if I scroll up over the top, you can see I've just entered my garage door with a portal frame next to it. And as you can see, I've entered the whole wall. Now my segment count is 54 feet 10 inches. My wall is 54 feet 10 inches. So it's all entered. I am compliant. So what's next? Well, what do you do with this? Let's go over and we can look at the project report. And this is what you can later print out. You can enter, obviously, all the walls and then print out the project report. So I'm going to scroll down to where this wall is. There it is. You get, uh, you get a nice little picture of the wall. Uh, you get the parameters of the wall. It required bracing 7.95 feet, qualified bracing 15.67, so plenty of bracing, it turns out. And it is compliant. Um, when I ran this with the double windows here and here instead of the single windows and the bump out for the door, uh, it, it barely worked. And we had eight point something feet of bracing. So it uh, uh, just shows uh, how difficult it can be sometimes. Okay, so now as part of this printout, though, you have all the bracing methods. Uh, you have the nailing required. Look at this. You have a 1,000 pound strap for that one portal frame. Really, everything that you need to show the building department, to show the builder on how to properly build this particular wall. Okay, I just for fun, let's go back to the wall and make a, a couple of changes. What if, uh, for example, let's go back to that same brace wall line. Here it is. And what if that brace wall uh, section one, rather than three feet, was only one foot? Okay. Now, if you recall, it doesn't actually contribute anymore as bracing. I, I understand I don't meet my wall length anymore, but just to make a couple changes to see how it affects things. And then let's go over to the portal frame at the very end. And let's say that we used, instead of the CSPF method, that we're going to use the uh, portal frame with hold downs. Uh, now, we, we probably wouldn't want to use that. Um, method because we don't need to, but uh, let's just say we did and see what I'm um, getting a little feedback on my garage door with. Let's change that. So if I've got a one foot eight inch segment again, um, and now I've changed this to a portal frame with hold downs. Let's go back and look at that project report again. It's changed a little bit, but uh, if you know, notice, now I have some hold down device requirements. I've got an 800 pound hold down device because that brace wall wind uh, uh, number one at the corner on the left is no longer an end restraint condition. And then down where I put the portal frame with hold downs, uh, you can see that I need this 4,200 pound hold down device. So that was just a quick uh, couple changes that you actually wouldn't make, but uh, I wanted to show that you could do that in, in what the project report will give you. Uh, at, at the correct time. All right, let's go back to my PowerPoint. Um, and we just did a quick example with that one. And I just want to, in my last minute or so here, uh, before we go to questions, so you, what do you give the billing official? One thing you could do is take a plan view, identify all the brace wall lines like you see here. This one's a real simple little box. They're not all that easy, are they? But brace wall lines one and two, brace wall lines A and B in the other direction, and then simply come in and show what type of bracing, uh, brace wall panel out of those 16 methods you happen to be using. Uh, here it's a, a method WSP, which would be the intermittent method. And then something like the chart up in the left that shows how much bracing is required and how you met that. That would be one way to do it. If you happen to like this APA bracing calculator, what you could do is simply take a plan view, which you already have. Again, mark your strategically placed braced wall lines. In this case, you have a 1, 2, 3 in the uh, left to right and an A, B, C, D vertically. Uh, simply place those and then use the bracing calculator as a handout to go with that because it's going to clearly show each one of those braced wall lines and the type of bracing within it. In fact, if I go back to that braced wall line calculator one more time, I have that whole house that we were just looking at um, entered. So I'm going to go to go ahead and open that up. I do want to leave this and I don't want to save it, so I'm going to import an existing project. And that happens to be this one right here. So I can bring in this design. Here's the whole thing 
and I'm going to go straight to the project report. I have entered this entire structure. And there it is. Okay, so I've got brace wall lines one through three and brace wall lines A through D. Obviously, in a printed format, they would all show up uh, in order. And as I scroll down these, you can see there's the, uh, the uh, back of the structure actually first. Um, this is an interesting brace wall line right here uh, because this included portions of the outside. It was the front of the house, the back of a three-car garage, and then the back wall of a two-car garage that's, that's actually an interior wall. So you can see right here that it used some gypsum board method along with the continuously sheet method. And that's allowed because it's an interior brace wall line. And then scrolling down, here's the two garage door openings with the portal frames. And again, you can see the tension tie requirements. This one happens to have a, a, a pony wall on top of it. So the, the tension tie requirements are a little bit greater than that 1,000 pound strap. All that information is right there uh, in front of you using this APA bracing calculator. So that would be another way, certainly, to submit plans, if you will. And with that, uh, uh, we'll go to questions in just a moment. And I uh, want to make note that everything I've said is intended to be educational. Obviously, I intend for it to be true and correct to the code. However, we always recommend that you consult your local jurisdiction or design professional to assure compliance with code and with proper uh, construction and performance requirements. And just as a reminder, uh, we've now completed three webinars in this series, and the next one will be on September 18th uh, at 3 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. And again, it'll be my colleague Roger Roach that will be talking about seismic-related provisions on that webinar. I've also placed on this slide, uh, my last slide, is my name and contact information. Feel free to contact me with any questions you might have. Uh, that website, performancewalls.org, is a whole host of great information specific to walls, bracing, advanced framing, energy, um, also uh, many CAD details that you can download and look at for, for wall framing. Um, we also have an APA help desk, and you can see the number for that. So with that, uh, Steve, uh, I'm going to turn it back to you and see if we uh, have any questions. Hi, Bob. Thanks. Uh, great job. And yes, uh, we do have a few here that are coming in. Kirk asked, can the APA calculator work for users designing homes in jurisdictions using the 2009 IRC? Okay. Yes. Uh, I think the question was, can you use it for the 2009 IRC? And the, the answer to that is absolutely. I'll pull it back up here real quick and go to the uh, uh, start new, yes, no. And I hit start new project. Right here, I have the choice for 2009 IRC or 2012 IRC. Obviously, the 2015 IRC is just out now, and we'll start working on adding a button for the 2015. But right now, 2009 and 2012 are both supported. Yes. Great. Gary asks, how does one get a copy of handouts? How does one get a copy of the handouts? Again, the webinar will be posted at performancewalls.org uh, fairly soon. And if you want a PDF copy of the slides, just give me an email and I can send those to you. Excellent. Carl asks, and oh, uh, that was the first part of the comment to me. <laughs> Looking forward to the APA calculator. It's a nice step from the Simpson Strong Tide version I've been using for years. So thanks, Carl, for that comment. Thomas asks, is the SDCD through D2 addressed? Is the, okay, seismic design category, the, the uh, higher, in the bracing calculator, if that's the question, and yes, the higher seismic design categories are handled in the bracing calculator, and I believe that that next webinar on September 18th, when Roger is talking about seismic, he plans on using the bracing calculator. He's actually the, the brainchild behind the bracing calculator. It's his baby, if you will, and he plans on using that with some examples for seismic wow. uh, items. Yeah, outstanding. Adolfo asks, um, is there a tool to designate wall lines offset from the actual wall locations? 
Okay, if, if I understand the question right, he's uh, referring back to our concept of effective braced wall lines. Um, and that we actually handled in the first webinar, webinar part one. Uh, and yes, you can have effective braced wall lines. Uh, in other words, an imaginary braced wall line that, that doesn't even fall on a wall as long as it's within four feet of, of actual walls. Uh, so this is a way that you can combine uh, different walls into one braced wall line. And this is a ICC interpretation that, uh, that you can do this concept. Great. Les White has his hand raised. Les, I've turned your audio on. Do you have a uh, microphone? or? Yeah, I do. Can Thanks for me? joining us, Les. Loud and clear. Yeah, I was just wondering if we can get a, uh, any way we can get an actual copy of the recordings of these wall braces seminars that we can put on our computer. Okay, well, again, they'll be posted on the website, so you'll be able to watch them over and over um, yeah. once they're posted there. As, as of today, uh, the part one was posted, and part two was just the recording was all just finalized and tweaked, and uh, it's going to be posted very soon. And then this part three that we just completed, I would expect to be up in a uh, in a timely manner. Okay, what does it cost on the calculator? Can you tell me? Uh, yeah, the calculator is free. It's an online tool. Um, you, uh, you send me a dozen. To... <laughs> What's that? Send me a dozen. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Again, we don't send it to you though. You use it online, but you yeah, can save good. your actual files. Uh, you know, so you, okay. once you enter something, you save that portion on your computer, but you use the actual calculator um, online. So uh, we just access that through performance. You uh, can go walls. to performancewalls.org. It's actually uh, the direct website is going to be apawood.org forward slash calculators. And that's going to take you straight to it. But you can get there from performancewalls.org as well. And again, it's not quite there yet, but it, it, it's going to be this month, and it's late in the month right now. So uh, yeah. this, this will be very, very soon available. All right. Thanks, Good. Les. Um, we're running out of time, Bob. But I don't see any other questions or some thank yous. And my thank you goes out to our audience for attending. Uh, I hope this has been very useful for you. I can tell from the downloads of the webinar that we do have on the APA website already that this has been a helpful tool, and I'm happy to provide it. So thanks, Bob, for uh, doing the, the third webinar for us. And I look forward to uh, the next two. I do, too. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you.